And when I found out the theme, I was excited because that's what time we live in. And as Pastor Jonathan was talking about, that's what the apostles thought. That's what everyone, the first century saints on up through the ages has thought. But as I was lying in the bed this morning, we, we are closer to Christ's return than any other generation. As we know, we, we are Bible historians, most of us. We know that Israel has become a nation. We know there's no other time in, in the world where nuclear pro- proliferation can come together and we can be destroyed, the planet can be destroyed at any moment because of war. All of those things point to the return of Christ. And not only the return of Christ, but the theme of how to respond in these times. Because as the pressure of the world and of the flesh comes on us more and more, we as believers should be standing out like the stars in the universe. Let's pray and we'll get into this part of Scripture. Father God, We come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would meet us here. We know that you will by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would pour into us individually what every one of us need at this present day and time. Whether we're going through small trials large trials, persecution, or suffering, whether we may think they are small or large, Lord, we know that you are there. And as uh, Pastor Jonathan said last night, and that stuck with me about you have called us to be holy. We will be holy just as our Father in heaven is holy. And if we just allow you to execute holy living in our lives, Lord, we're going to respond adequately to these times. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here to pour into us, to exhort, to rebuke, to encourage, to do any and everything that we need to spur us on to love and good deeds, that we would be sons of righteousness, that we would come alongside one another, encourage our brothers when they are struggling in a manner that's pleasing to you. That's what we're here for. And we ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to the Father God. Amen. That word responding is to make a return by some action as in an answer, and that's what we are to give. And as you know, the last couple of teachings, uh, especially I think I said it on one Sunday morning when me and my wife were having a small spat, and I thought of that Newton's third law, and it's been just churning in my heart. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So that's simply put that in every interaction, there is a pair of forces acting on the two interacting objects. And the size of that force on the first object equals the same size of force on that second object. I've said all that to say this. I wonder if, I know who said it, I wonder if that's a true statement when it comes to being men of Christ. Hmm. Because I feel that we are not responding to the times as forcefully as we should. Because it seems to me that we have either been oblivious to what's going around in the climate, in the culture of our world, being complacent, or apathetic, either we're knocked down or almost ready to tap out because of trials and tribulations that we might be going through. 
So once again, I commend everyone here this morning. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. But we're going to press on in to what the Lord has for us. But no doubt about it, we are definitely not responding with the same force that's coming against us. And I'm speaking of the world and everything that's going on in it. My question, though, to you this morning is why? Why aren't men of God, and I'm including myself in there because like Pastor Jonathan says, and as we all know, none of us have arrived yet. And I begin to think, is it the residual effect of COVID that's come two years prior? Is it the supply chain we are worried about or the rising crime rate? You know, I'm a, I'm a stickler for watching the news. I don't read the news. And I'm amazed at the crime. I was watching one guy just came up to another guy. He had a mask on and just hit him, cold cocked him, knocked him into a car. They said a few hours later, he died. As he was lying there, they reached in his pocket, grabbed his wallet, two other guys, and just took off. I've watched where people are, are at the train station, and they're, be, they're being thrown off onto the tracks and killed. And all of that has, has a pressing effect on us, where there's the failing economy, the inflation rate, my question is this morning, where is your hope? Where is my hope? And it's certainly not in the government. It's certainly not in the economy. It's in the word of God. It is God's love letter to us where our hope should be like an anchor firm. All these things Everything that we do in life, whether good or bad, whether it's a job, whether it's education, whether it's daily living, if we're not careful, can become an albatross around our neck. Because all of those things, you guys, are going to fail us where there's once again a job, where there's an education, where there's a gadget in our hands that help take the time away and keeps us distracted, they're going to fail. And as I've been doing my weekly reading, I came across Psalms 112, verse 1 through 7, and it just spoke to me, so I'm going to read it. it. may have nothing to do with this, but you might be blessed with it. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments, do we? His descendants, we want that, those of us who have kids, his descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken, responding to the times. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast. Why is it steadfast? Trusting in the Lord. We are men who I believe love Jesus Christ, and hopefully we are trusting in him. But I find it very ironic that we can trust in Jesus for our salvation, for our souls, but when it comes to our daily lives, we find it difficult to trust him with our marriages, with our families, with our job, with our help. I believe one thing that interferes with us trusting in Jesus better, or should I say more effectively, is we're too short-sighted. And what I mean by that is 
we should be playing the long game as believers. That's what it's all about. We've been born again into the household of faith, and faith is all about playing the long game. It's about eternal things. You ever notice you're chilling at home, you're watching TV, and then something perks your ears. Your, uh, it, there might be a prescription that they're talking about, and it says it's going to help you with an ailment or anything. And you say, you're thinking, I might try that. It sounds good. But at the end of that commercial, it begins to list all of these side effects, and it just continues. And by the time it's halfway through, you say, hey, forget about it. I'm better off with the ailment I have. I noticed that a lot. Our loving Savior, he's not like that. He has told us up front what to expect when we follow him, when we repent of our sins and give our lives to him. He tells us in Matthew 10, 38, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Chapter 16, 24, he says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone even desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Dr. Luke chapter 9, he says this in verse 61, 62, And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I, I love the rich young ruler in, Matt, uh, in Mark. Jesus, it says, after he is, says, what is the greatest commandments? Jesus gets to the heart of the issue and he says, then Jesus looking at him, he looked into his soul. He peered down into his very being. And it says, looking at him, he loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures where? Not here, in heaven. That's the long game. That's eternal things that men of God should be focused on, should be striving for in the midst of this depraved world here. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And then Jesus says of himself in John 16, 31 through 33, we all know this very well. Jesus answered them, do you now believe after the Seder, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, and that, will be, and that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. And then he tells us straight up, in the world you will have tribulations. The tribulum, a long piece of wood most of the time with iron, uh, uh, bits of iron, bits of steel in it, and it would go over the, the, the wheat to separate the wheat from the chaff, so it had to be a pressing. That's what Jesus is saying. In this world, if you follow me, if you're living for me, you're going to be pressed. You're going to have trials. But he said, be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus tells his disciples up front, if you want to run this race well and be the salt and light that I've called you to be, learn to play the long game. That's what he's saying here. We need to learn to navigate the long game because as I prayed this morning, we're just not in it for ourselves. We men being the head of the household, when the time of pressing comes, our family members are watching. They are gauging our reactions to everything that's happening in the world. Lydia asks me all the time, 
The Lord's coming soon. You, do you think he's coming soon with all the things that are going on? And I say, maybe, maybe. But we've got to live in this world anyway. That's why as men, it's very vital that we commune with God day by day, daily, getting into his presence, allowing him to speak to us. Now, I'm going to be hard because all you guys know me and I love you. I understand three or four verses and hitting the door and running off, but that's truly not communing. We need to carve out a special time in the day that we sit and let the Lord, allow the Lord to speak to us where everything, all of distractions are put aside and says, Lord, here I am, speak to me. Sort of like Moses, when he would go up on Sinai and just enjoy communing with the Lord. And when he, we, under, we know the scripture, and when he would come down, his face would be aglow because he's been in the presence of the Lord. That's the way it is with us. Our face might not be aglow, but our hearts are aglow when we commune with the Lord. So whatever comes our way in the trials or in the persecution or in the sufferings, we're okay. That's what Jesus is wanting us to understand any and every time he allows, he allows a trial to come our way. That's what it takes to navigate this world successfully. And I'm not talking about uh, monetary successes or material successes. But what Jesus and what the Holy Spirit and what the Godhead is wanting is spiritual successes in our life. That's what brings him fame. And we can only do that through the long game, sitting, putting our attention on things that are above. The important game that will match force with force As we see these days getting darker, we need to respond accordingly. So, how do we handle trials? How do we handle setbacks, heartaches? We've all had them. And if we keep living, we will have more of them. And tragedy, tragedies. First Peter tells us this in chapter 4, verse 12. And as I was, I went back and I read the entire chapter of first Peter. And I noticed only twice, even you would think at the beginning of his letter, the Holy Spirit would have said, okay, Pete, tell them how much I love them. He doesn't do that. I think it's the third chapter where he finally says, beloved. Jonathan may have said it last night, gird up your loins. Beloved, this is what I want you to do. And and when he said, beloved, this is what I want you to do, gird up the loins of your mind because you're going to need it. Something is coming down the pipe. But he makes it very clear in verse 12. He says, beloved, and it speaks of God's divine, infinite love for us. Peter reminds these fellow believers who were suffering persecution, like Pastor Jonathan said, or they were getting ready to suffer persecution just because they were believers. They are beloved, the Holy Spirit wants them to know. These things that are coming your way is not because you did anything wrong. Don't get it twisted when trials come our way. When it seems like that cloud just continues to stay over our head for days and months and maybe years, God is saying, beloved, I love you. I'm here with you. And we're going to go through this together. So that's something when we go through a trial that we can lay our head on the pillow knowing that God loves us. And that helps us endure heartache and pain. He says, beloved, do not think it strange. And what he's really saying, stop thinking that it's an alien thing. 
that trials come your way. Trials for the Christian is not an elective. I used to love taking elective classes. I had picked the ones I wanted, but no, 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 no. We can't get away like that. God is saying these trials, these persecutions, these sufferings are a mandatory course if you are a believer. That goes with the territory. Paul says this, yes, all those who desire to live godly will suffer what? Huh, yeah, right up front. That's what's going to happen. If we are living godly, that's the question. If we are following the Lord, we're not going to do it perfectly, but once again, that's our aim, that's our goal, and that's how we walk. It's going to happen. That's what's going to happen here. Being a believer, being a believer doesn't keep us immune from suffering. And we must understand that we are uh, swimming upstream. I love the chosen, the introduction, when all the fish are going one way, and then all of a sudden, one turns, and then another turn, and it shows they are swimming upstream. That's the way it is when you are a believer. Matter of fact, we should think suffering as a natural and an expected thing, and that suffering for righteousness' sake is a byproduct of the world's hatred of Jesus Christ and also to those who bear his name and reflect him in their life. I'll put it like this. If we are reflecting Jesus Christ in our lives, trials will come our way. It's the so-called worldly Christian where trials may never hit them. But if we are following him, like Jesus has spoken about in his word, it's a byproduct. Matthew 10, he says this, and you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, Jesus says. So he says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, the smelting in a furnace. That's what those two words, those words mean there. Proverbs 27 the beginning of verse 21 says this, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. These believers were in, if you will, a smelting furnace of persecution in which their lives, even though they were in it, their lives were being purified. He says, which is to try you. That word try is parasmos, a trial of man's integrity of man's virtue, of fidelity. We might say we can handle this or we can handle that. Peter said, Lord, if all others leave you, I will never leave you. I will never deny you. God had to show him what was really in him. And that's what he does with us all the time. Anytime we think we don't need him and we can do it by ourselves, he has to show us that we need him, and that all that does is draws us closer to him, which is to try you as though some strange thing, once again, some alien thing happens to you. And that those three words, happen to you, mean go together. He says, I want us to understand that nothing just happens to the life of a believer, especially the suffering for righteousness sake. Once again, God allows any trial, any persecution, God allows that to filter through his loving hands. Don't think it's strange. He's trying to purify us, to, to make us into the image of his dear son. When we suffer for Christ's sake, and we will, we should be encouraged to see God's good purposes behind the suffering whether it's difficult or not. And what we're doing when we're abiding under that trial, abiding under that suffering, and doing it the correct way without murmuring or complaining, what does it do? His glory, his fame shines brighter 
and brighter. I know most of you guys. I know some of the trials most of you guys have gone through. And to see you walk through those trials and still be here and still keep the faith, God is pleased. But we cannot rest on our laurels because we're living holy lives, so more will come. He says in verse 13, when the trials come, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And as I was thinking about that, that's still tough for me. God is working on me. But then I said, I've got, the, I've got a great example. Many years ago, when I was a big-time true Atlanta Falcons fan, the Falcons were in the Super Bowl. And I'm just think, okay, I'll put myself in the Patriots' side in their shoes. Think of all of the people at halftime being a Patriot fan turn the TV off. So this is over with. It's a blown game. I can't believe we let Atlanta beat us. And then wake up the next morning or two or three hours later and find out that the Patriots had won. They're still happy. They're still excited. But it's nothing like watching it and going through the ebb and flow of the game, walking through the ebb and flow of life when the pressure is on us, not giving up, and all of a sudden, Here comes the ray of sunlight, and God says, this is what I do for all of my children if they just hang in there. That's the glory he's speaking of here when he says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Why? That when his glory is revealed, and it's going to be revealed, whether it happens now whether people are casting you, reproaching you, casting you in the teeth, saying things about you that is not true, and they all find out, no, he's pure. We were wrong about this guy. Or in heaven, when we get there, we will glory. When his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. That's what he means by that. We hang in there. Think of Abraham. God speaks to Abraham in chapter 21 of Genesis. He comes and says, okay, Sarah is going to have a child. That's in 13. Sarah is going to have a child. And he comes back in 21, and he speaks of Abimelech, that everything's going to be okay there. When Isaac is born, most scholars say this is, this is between 25 and 30 years before it's recorded that God speaks to Abraham again. Every word that's come out of God's mouth to Abraham has been nothing but pleasing to him. Abraham, your name, Abram, your name is going to be changed to Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to do this. Your, your wife Sarah is going to have a child. Every word that God has said has been great words. 30 years later, 25 years later, he speaks to him in Genesis 22 too. Never heard this before. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac. He knows everything. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Abraham, the Bible says, got up early the next morning. And he would have did that. And then 2,000 years later, when Jesus, when the father offers up his son, his only one of a kind son, I wonder in some way, Did God the Father go to Abraham and hang out with him because he could find no one else that could understand 
what he was going through in some semblance of the way besides Abraham. That's what it means sharing in the fellowship of his suffering. You see, we just don't go through trials and persecutions for no reason at all. But we go, and when we go through those trials, what the Father is doing, he's hollowing out a place in our heart, in our lives, that when we come through that, he can pour all of his grace and all of his love and all of his intimacy while we're going through that with him. And we understand it's tough to go through something and no one can understand. That makes the trial, that makes the persecution even tougher. But the Father, when he allows persecution and trials to come our way, he comes right along with us and he gives us grace to go through it. That's a much more intimate walk when we come out on the other side. Now, I'm not talking about, I was talking to uh, Jonathan about this watching the game the other night. I'm not speaking about being a masochist. I hate pain. I hate suffering. I think we all do. But when they come our way, the Bible tells us we need to rejoice in these trials because we're enduring this persecution and these trials that the Lord is allowing to come to us because there's a greater glory, you guys, involved in this. Isaac, he's in Philistine territory. And remember, Abraham, he dug a couple of wells. Isaac goes back and he begins to uncover wells. And as he would uncover a well or dig a well, what would the Philistines do? They would cover them back up. And I've always wondered about that. The Bible never mentions one time that Isaac complained. He named it Signa. Essek, I think, was the first one. He'd go and dig another well. They'd come and take it, cover it up. He'd name the second one Signa. We haven't heard from God. Isaac is not complaining at all. These are trials. These are persecutions. And then he finally digs another well. No hint of Isaac complaining, and he names it Rehoboth. God has made a space for me. All the time, if he would have given up, he wouldn't have never went into that spacious place. God didn't say a word there. He was just, you thought he was doing things, he was, he was trying to hurt Isaac. But all along, he was doing something that would benefit him. That's the way it works going through trials, where there's trials over looking for a job, looking for a better job, where there is family members, where there is a marriage, whatever it is. If you're a child of God, he's going to turn those things out for good. We just need to trust him. And then he says in verse 14, if you are reproached, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Now we get a manner of the character of the persecutions, the sufferings that's going on here. It's the reproach that comes from the world. The world calls us intolerant, and the gospel is. The world calls us bigoted, but we're not. And they tell us that because we don't go along with this agenda, because we don't agree that there are many roads that leads to heaven, that it's okay to live in sin, and, and they champion sexual sin, that it's okay. The world is mad because we say God made them male and female, and it's true. Men will never be able to give birth to a child, but that's what they're propagating on us but we know what we're dealing with. And the blowback from that is persecution if you stand up for the truth. Psalms 36, 4 says this, he devises wickedness on his bed. And when I read that, I believe, because I'll let you know right away, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I believe right away that even now, COVID-19 
was a trial balloon. COVID-19 killed many people, and I'm saddened for that. But what it also did, it began to shrink the church. And I was telling my wife, I said, you know what I think the next, th next thing's going to be? I believe gas prices might get so high that one church, and then it might affect the next church and the next church. I'll say, you know, we don't need to drive to Wednesday evening service. We'll just come on Sunday. And what that does, they get together and they try to make the church less effective. We can drive anywhere else we want to go. But no, I can't come to Wednesday evening service because gas prices is too high. But we have to understand what we're fighting with. Every action, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Are we fighting back on our knees? Because that's where the battle is waged. By being men of prayer and walking in love, especially toward those that are outside the household of faith. Peter says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. And this word blessed is not the Beatitudes, happy are you. This is a different word for blessed. The context is prosperous are you. And it refers to being prosperous spiritually. Yep, that's what it says. Because if the world is persecuting you, it's an indication of the spiritual prosperity that's in your life. I think of Rick and Joanne, what they're going through. And I've been to see him several times and how he's still cheerful and she's still cheerful and they're still sharing Christ when they were at the hospital. And just like Peter says here by the Holy Spirit, you can see the Spirit of of God resting on them. That's not exclusive. That's for any and every believer who goes through trials. If we have the right attitude that the Lord has allowed this trial to purify me, to make me more like Christ, it's going to be all right. Once again, it's the worldly believer who don't have to worry about trials and tribulation because they're not rubbing the world the wrong way. But you better believe if you are a believer and you're walking with the Lord, you will have trials, Peter says here. He says, the Spirit of God and of God rests upon you. That word rest upon you is an agriculture term. And what it means, it means that when a, when a farmer would sow his land, after he would sow, uh, sow the crops, a, a, a hard crop, one or two years, he would sow something simple the next year. So take, he would take the stress off the land, and that would benefit the field. It's the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight when he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you. If you come to me as an unbeliever with all your sin, I will clean you up. I will forgive you of your sin, and then I will send you out. And because you have an intimate walk with me, this is the catch because it's a two-edged sword here. As you're walking with me and you're close to me, the byproduct of that, because you're going against the grain, you're going against the world, that persecution will come automatically. That's how it's set up. That's how it always happens. Now, as I say that, I want you to look back on your life, the last five years, the last two years, the last six months. How much persecution have you had? How many trials have you had? Because I say it all the time, when I look over my life, I've had more good days than bad days. 
God knows our frames, that we are nothing but dust. And when he allowed trials to come our way, it's for a specific reason, a specific purpose. And he's wanting to conform us unto the image of Christ. You might tell your children since they've been born that Jesus Christ is God, that he's the only way to heaven. And then a trial comes, and you've spoken that to them. Then a trial comes, and they've never believed it. But because the trial came, and they still watch you live a holy life, they give their lives to the Lord. That's how it happens. We have to put feet to this man. Yes, we don't look for trials. We don't look for persecution, but it's a byproduct of living a holy life, and we should expect them. And when they come our way, we need to gird up the loins of our mind and say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? Let me continue to live holy. Let me continue to rejoice in you. Let me continue to go to church instead of going to the bar. Let me live a holy life. That's what he says here. The spirit of the glory, even the spirit of God, is resting upon you. He says the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you on their part. He is blasphemed. That's the unbeliever. He's not spoken well of them, and he won't be. But on your part, because you're living a holy life, even through the trials, in your trials, he's going to be glorified, and that's what the Lord wants. And then he says in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. The word suffer is the context here. And what he's saying, this is what you used to be. This is what you used to do. So now that you are a believer, leave all those other things behind and live holy lives. He says in verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, and that if this first class condition is, and you will, and you will suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Now, Jonathan did a little backdrop of what was going on But I find this amazing, some of the suffering they were going through. And and at that time, the cult of the Caesars, they had to worship Caesar as a god. They had many gods you could go to the temple, but Caesar was one. And once a year, they had to go in and take that incense and bow the knee to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. Now, how would the Christian feel by doing that? They couldn't if they were who they said they were. And so if they didn't do that, they couldn't buy food, they couldn't eat, it was trouble. And that's what brought on persecution. Nero, but there were 10 waves of persecution that happened in Rome. And these believers were suffering here big time, and they wouldn't bow the knee to this. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. The world calls us bigoted because we stand for the truth and intolerant. They want nothing to do with truth. In our climate, in our world, circularism is their God. And we automatically rub the world the wrong way, and we should. Speak the truth in love. I'm reminded, like David Hickey said, when we went and spoke to those three Muslims, I was on a high, and I told you this, I was on a high that we had went and witnessed with those four guys, and I, even though they were unbelievers, I was excited. Man, we got to share Christ. There's an opportunity. But when we went to talk to those three guys, it was just dark. And I told them, this is what I know. We will 
all of us will have recall, whether in heaven or in hell. And I said, I want you to know that Jesus Christ was more than a prophet. He is God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And they were pleasant and they listened. But when I left, my point is when we left them, I told David my heart was just saddened because of one soul, three souls, that if they died that day would open their eyes in hell. But we must speak the truth. We could have never came to them and preached to like Westboro Baptist Church who just speaks of, hey, you're going to hell, you're doing that. No, we must be lovable, but we must defend the truth. He says in verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. We will, every believer will appear at the judgment seat of God. And we won't be judged by our sin. We've been forgiven. But what we've done since we've been a believer, and that's a very sobering moment. I don't know how much you think about that, but I think about it. That's a sobering moment to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe he will say, Victor, I had all of this for you, but I can only give you this because you didn't walk with me the way you should. I had so much to abundantly give you, but when I would send a trial your way, You would fall apart instead of drawing close to me. You would run away from me. You would make excuses why you would stop coming to me. But you're here. So that's a sobering statement right there. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He goes on to say that each one may receive the things done in his body. And if it begins... With us first, Peter says, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Christ has paid the penalty for everyone's sins. Believers have witnessed or should be witnessing to the lost. But if they reject the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, they will perish in their sins. And then he says in verse 18, Now, if, and it's true here, and if the righteous one is scarcely saved. And when he means scarcely saved, he's not saying we barely made it to heaven. He's saying with difficulty here. It's like Paul. I think when he went to Lystra and they began to worship Paul and and, and Barnabas and they said, you guys are gods. And Paul was saying, no, 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 we're not gods. And they were about to tear them apart and they had to flee. That's the difficulty he's speaking of here. It's going to be difficult. The situation, the climate is going to be difficult. But continue to follow me, and you're going to heaven here. Tertullian said this, the blood of the saints, some say the blood of the martyrs, are the seed of the church. The church never grows the way it does Unless persecution comes. When persecution comes to the church, it grows exponentially. But when we just kind of float along on the lazy river, we get comfortable. God has to shake us. He has to wake us up. Get back. Draw close to me. That's what Tertullian is saying here. He says, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then verse 19, therefore, a close to this, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit, and that word commit is a banking term, to give charge as a deposit. I'm going to read again. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, when it comes, commit their souls to him in doing good, live holy lives as to a faithful creator. God is faithful. God will comfort us. God will keep us no matter what trial we may go through, no matter what persecutions that may come our way. And we will come out on the better side looking more and more like Jesus Christ. 
Peter exhorts the believers here that, yes, in this life we're going to have tribulation, we're going to have persecutions, but don't let that stop you from following the Lord by giving your all to the Lord because that's what the enemy wants. And let me say this, that's what the flesh wants because the flesh likes an easy time, an easy road. But Jesus says, says, if you want me to be able to pour into your lives and enrich you when suffering comes, rejoice and allow me to deal with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make everything okay because I'm a good God and I've allowed this trial to come your way. And if you continue to follow me and yield to me and live holy lives, you're going to bring glory to me, and that's what matters. Let's pray, you guys. Father, none of us enjoy, enjoys going through trials. None of us likes persecution. But as the Apostle Paul said, those that desire to live godly will suffer persecution. So, Lord, give us grace not to think it strange when those things happen. But let us draw near to you, understanding that through this trial, through this persecution, that we're going to bring glory to you, and we're going to look more and more like our Savior. And then we can help others when they go through trials. We can spur them on to, hey, it's, go it's going to be okay. But Father, remind us also of the times that we live in and how to respond to them. Let none of us suffer as an evildoer, but let us walk in love. Let us walk in in harmony with our Savior. Father, I pray for every man and boy here, Father, that we would draw close to you, that we would learn to when, understand that when trials come our way, that we not think it's strange, that we can even say, Lord, I must be doing something right. And Lord, I want to pass this test with flying colors because I want to bring glory to you. Father, as we continue throughout the day, as we discuss different things, may our conversation be sweet, may we encourage one another, and may we enjoy our time together with you in the midst of us. And I ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to the Father God. Amen.